Bless you, my brother. Oh, praise God. Well, I want to start. You know, we could not do what we do in Africa without people like you here supporting us. It's impossible. I mean, people always say the dream of a missionary is to be self-sustaining, and I'm like, wow, that's a far-off pipe dream because the people where we, God sent us, are so, 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 so poor that, like, to do anything that would raise money from them is, like, absurd to the highest degree. It's like they need help. So I just want to say thank you. As a church, you guys have supported us. Wow, 2008 probably, maybe 2009, I don't remember exactly, the beginning of 2009, I came here and met Zeke, and we've been friends and partnering together ever since, so I just wanted to say thank you, and we give all the glory to God, amen. You know, because it's true, I understand this, it's true, you get to serve Jesus, amen. Every good and perfect gift that God has given you comes down from the Father of lights who never changes, so if there's anything good you have, God is the one who's given it to you. I mean, and he's given it to you for, to use for his glory and for others' good, and even your own good, amen? And he is the way maker, amen? I'm, I, man, there's, I'm in Uganda, and there's like, pro, I got to tell you the story because it just happened, and I want to encourage you with it. I wasn't planning on sharing this, but it just happened. I was like struggling. Last night, I was talking to my wife, and there's some problems in Uganda, and it just was ugly, and I woke up this morning really struggling, and I needed prayer. And I called my wife to pray for me, and she didn't answer her phone in Uganda. My wife's in Uganda, Danielle. And uh, here's a picture of her. If you don't know her, there, we got our table back there. You can see my wife is there just running the place while I'm here trying to encourage people to partner with us and just to sh encourage people to follow Jesus. But I didn't have, I'm calling my wife. I'm like, please, I need somebody to pray for me. And I don't know where Zeke was. I'm like, just somehow all of a sudden had this moment of panic. And at the exact moment when I was thinking, Lord, I need somebody to pray for me. Who can I call? My phone buzzed. And it's Deanna, my sister-in-law, who also is our ministry partner. She's in, actually on vacation in Mexico. And she texted me at the exact second that I said, Lord, I need somebody to pray for me. And she said, Bill, I'm praying for you. Tell me a God isn't good, amen? We serve a God who is faithful. He is a way maker. He is a promise keeper. He's everything, those songs that we sing about, everything, everything. And I just want to encourage you, man, that just blew me away. It's like, you know, when God does something like that, it reminds me, what? That he's with me. He hasn't left me. He hasn't forsaken me. And what he wants to do in my life and what he's done in my life is the same in all of us. Amen? And God sent us to Uganda. I didn't really want to go to Uganda. We started Agents for Christ, two families, the James family and the Chafee family, two RVs, just going out with one simple vision. Share the gospel and encourage others to do the same. And through that ministry of Agents for Christ, God all of a sudden just, I mean, he was blessing the work that we were doing in America. And then all of a sudden he said, ah, eh, Dave, you go back to Calvary Chapel Southeast, our home church. I got a place, something for you to do there. And he says, Bill and Daniel, I'm, you're going to Uganda. I mean, it was very clear, both of those things God speaking to us. And we had no idea what God was doing. And all of us now we look back. Many, many years later, and God was preparing Dave and Deanna to start the 10th hour project in New Mexico, which is just exploding. If you know any young people, 18 to 25 or even older, uh, that need or have no direction and need, well, actually every person 18 to 25 should go because actually it prepares you for the rest of your life, amen? But it's a nine-month discipleship program. They three months at the campus in New Mexico doing biblical discipleship with different pastors come and teach and many people involved in teaching. Three months basically going around America sharing the gospel and teaching others to share their faith. And then they come to Uganda for three months to serve with the Uganda Kids Project. It's amazing what God is doing through you, 10th Hour Project. And my ministry partner and brother and sister Dave and Deanna Chafee run that side of Agents for Christ. And me and my wife are blessed to be in Uganda. We've been in Uganda the whole time during Corona. Actually... Uh, we really prayed. Everybody bailed. When Corona hit, every, almost every missionary in Uganda left. And we prayed. I don't know. I don't know about the rest of the world, but in Uganda, pretty much everybody was leaving. And we prayed, and we're like, what should we do, Lord? And God very clearly told us to stay. And right away, when they closed the schools and everything shut down, a lot of the, some of our older students felt discouraged. And one of the girls 
went off and got married. She's like, ah, I have no hope. My school's closed. My dad's a drunkard. I have no family, no hope at home. So I might as well go get married. And she left. And I was like so crushed by this. One of our students just got married and ran off. And I went to the government. I'm like, we cannot lose these girls. And I wrote a letter to the government saying I need to bring my girls back. And we had a three-month or a two-month, however long it was. It was 60 teenage girls living in my house for at least two months. We did a women's retreat for these girls, and it was amazing. And we say, God used it to save many of those girls to, to know that corona is just a passing thing. Amen? God is bigger than corona. God's bigger than anything we face. And uh, we were blessed to stay there, but... Wow, God is doing so much in Uganda, it's hard to even believe. It's hard to even share because we started with two Walmart tents. And you remember, the night that you go to Walmart right now, I just saw at Walmart, $99 pop-up tent. It pops up in like one minute, right, one second. I lived in a Walmart tent on the hill in Uganda for three months. People thought we were completely insane, and we probably were. As I look back, we had no security, nothing. We just lived on a tent, and we were building the mission center, trusting the Lord. But God is faithful. And now I look back at those pictures. I just sent that picture to somebody last night. I wish I should have given it so you could put it on your screen. But, man, what God has done is God wants to do exceedingly abundantly above what we can ask, think, or even imagine through a spirit that lives in us. And, man, we've seen that in Uganda. But I want to encourage you. God wants to do it in your life wherever you are. So just trust him. But right now in Uganda, we, God would bless with a medical center. Our primary school uh, just exploding. We... Our primary school performed very well, so it jumped from 200 students to 500 students almost. We now have 465 kids in our primary school where we teach them the Bible every single day. Every day is my job. Every morning I teach chapel to these kids. I love it. I love those kids. Actually, when I came back to come to America, it took me like an hour to leave because I had to hug, hug like 200 kids. They all wanted to hug me, say bye to their dad. I think you have a struggle being a dad for a couple kids or a five kids. I got 200 plus kids that call me dad, and it's difficult, but I love them so much, and it's amazing. But we blessed God. Uh, we, f- we started with our primary school with like a kindergarten to, to third grade, and then we added each year all the way till seventh grade is the last year in primary school, and this year we started our high school. We've been building the high school. We have our first class of 27 students. And it said, do not despise small beginnings, amen? The primary school started with 17 kids, and now we have 465 secondary schools starting with 27. And the goal is 180 kids because we're only having like 30 per class. So primary school, secondary school is going to be small because we want to really disciple these high school kids as they go out into the world for Jesus. I have a little video. Do you have it queued up? We have a little video, two minutes. No, there's sound. It's actually Dave and Deanna singing. Song Dave wrote the song. If you can hear it. Just 
I mean, uh, just a little snippet of the amazing things God's doing through Agents for Christ that uh, is possible because of you, amen? Please don't stop praying for us. But we have a table out in the back. We have little cards, for, uh, just little mission, prayer cards for, for me and my wife in Uganda. Please take one. If God puts it on your heart to please pray for us. But if God puts it on your heart, we, Corona really took a hit for Uganda, even I'm sure missionaries everywhere. We lost about 75 child sponsors out of the 400 kids. So we also have a bunch of kids for sponsorship. If you are interested in sponsoring a kid, these kids, we minister to them every day, all the time. There's not, this is not some program where you're sending money to some thing that the money's all, 90% of the money's going into some big wig's pocket and 10% goes to the kids to give them some little nibbles. No, this is all the money goes to the program. So, um, we also have some brochures about our ministry if you're interested, and I'd love to talk to you. There's a bunch of crafts back there that are made by Ugandan men and women to support their families. It's all by donation only. You can t- if you don't have any money, take whatever you want. I don't care. Just pray for us. Amen. If you ever want to give a donation, we appreciate it. But uh, this morning, I'm here to encourage you in the word. Anything I'm forgetting about Uganda? I, I mean, there, I would tell Zeke a lot of stories. Sometimes there's so many stories, it's hard to tell them sometimes. It's like, Wow. Uh, we're going to be talking about more things as I go through this message, but again, I'm here to encourage you, but I'm also here to challenge you, because uh, God's not interested in our comfort, amen? He wants to ch- use us. He wants to stretch us and grow us. He's not, people say, it's, I don't know where this is biblical or where people came up with this, but God is not content to where, leave you where you're at, amen? He wants to see you draw closer with him. You do walk with him closer. Be, allow, open yourself to use by him, amen? Not just in Uganda. Everywhere where you live, even in your house with whoever comes in your house, your children and every one of your neighbors and all of your family and everywhere you go, people need what you got. His name is Jesus Christ and he is alive. The word in Uganda, Yesu Ahulile, Yesu Ahulile, Jesus is alive, amen? We'll turn your Bibles to James chapter 4. We're going to be talking about the spiritual battles that we all face today. James chapter 4, verses 7 to 10, and um, this message I called it, Winning the War, Winning the War, James 4, 7 to 10. Let me read and then I will pray. Lord, it says in James 4, 7, therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Let me pray. God, we give you thanks. God, you are good. And you are the way maker. You are the miracle worker. You are the God who saved and the God who loves us. And the God who loved us so much that you sent your only begotten son, Jesus, to die in our place. So that if we will just believe and trust in you and turn from our sins and surrender daily and walk with you, God, you will do great and mighty things through us that you want to use us. But today, Jesus, I pray you'd speak to each person in this room. Holy Spirit, fill this place that everything I say and everything I do would bring you glory. And that, God, we leave here empowered by you, your Holy Spirit, to serve you. Wherever you lead us, in Jesus' name, amen. So as I said, I'm going to be talking about spiritual battles. We all face them. And what is a spiritual battle? Or what is a battle? A battle means a fight, an encounter between enemies or opposing armies, an engagement between two forces. Keeping it simple, what is a battle? A battle is a fight. A spiritual battle is what? A spiritual fight, amen, between forces in the heavenlies. God, creator of all things, and the devil, the enemy. Even Paul teaches us in Ephesians 6.12, he says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, right? We're not enemies of each other. Your enemy is not the person sitting next to you or your neighbors. We, but we against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. That's who our battle's against. Amen? That's the spiritual fight, spiritual fight we all face. But in order to have victory... I really believe we must acknowledge that it's real. I think a lot of people go around pretending it's not real. It's like, ah, there's no enemy. There's nothing. I can just do whatever I want. Heaven or hell, doesn't matter. I'm just going to live my life. Or let's the great lie today. There's easy believism, right? You can do whatever you want, and God will still, I mean, he does love us. 
of sin brings serious consequences. And the enemy wants to destroy us. And the battle that we face against the enemy is for our own souls. The souls of your children. The souls of your family and friends. We don't want to give the enemy one second of credit, though. Because the devil, I don't give him one moment of, time, of your time. Not one second. Amen? Not one moment of fear, not one second, because he, he's defeated already. Jesus already defeated the devil. Chuck Smith always called him, the devil had his usurped authority. That means his authority is going away, and it's very little. People talk about the spiritual world like it's not real, that it's, you know, it's not going to happen to me, that this is just some big fairy tale, but I'm telling you it's real, and it's raging now, here, even in this place. Everywhere we go, we're facing a battle, an enemy who wants to destroy us, and God who wants to restore us and empower us and help us. It's everywhere. Can't, can't fake it. It's real. In Uganda, we see witch doctors. Witch doctors are, wow, when I first came to Uganda, I was like, what in the world is that? Drums. Every Saturday night, boom, boom, boom. Well, I could do it right there, but I won't. Boom, 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 all night long, Saturday night. I'm like, what in the world is that drum? It's the witch doctors. All Saturday night, they, the drums would be beating. I could look out my back window, and I see down the hill to the lights going to the witch doctor's house, doing whatever they're offering, their sacrifices to the devil for whatever. Weird, man. Came to Yushunga out in the southwest Uganda where we now serve, and they're worshiping a tree. We find this tree. We're going to talk about that more later. We see kids demonically possessed, oppressed. It's real. We see it every day. But the tr battle's here, too, in America. It just looks different. In Uganda, they're worshiping a tree. In America, what? They're worshiping self. They're worshiping a team. Go Celtics. Amen? And there's nothing wrong with enjoying a team, right? Having a sports team or enjoying sports. But there's a difference between enjoying a sport and worshiping a, a team. Amen? You know the difference. You see those crazy people that are, like, painting their face I see it in college games especially. They're completely, it's like 20 below zero, and the dude's got no shirt on. He's painted orange or whatever. I mean, what is he worshiping? God? No, whatever. He's worshiping a team, a person, right? Sadly, in this day and age, we have worshiping of self. It's a huge problem. Materialism. People spend billions and billions of dollars on worshiping self. Trying to make ourselves feel good. And I mean, amen. I mean, it's not that God wants you to suffer. But there's a line between taking care of your needs and worshiping yourself. And we should be careful. Because we should only worship. There's only one God. His name is Jesus. And that's alone who we should worship. Here we come to the book of James. The half-brother of Jesus Christ. He writes in the first three chapters, laying out these battles that we all face, or these problems. Talks about being double-minded unstable in all our ways i see that in uganda people they'll come to jesus they'll come and ask me to pray for them and i'll come again and ask me to pray for them and for whatever reason god doesn't move then they're like ah jesus ain't doing nothing so let me go visit the witch doctor that's a perfect example of being what double minded unstable in all your ways being only hearers of the word i mean not doers showing personal favoritism to the rich speaking empty words not true faith an evil tongue, and many other things. But as we come to chapter 4, James clearly addresses this war going on inside of us. This battle between good and evil. Jesus and Satan. Battle for our souls. And today we're going to be looking at three things quickly. I have, oh, i got time. Wow, my glasses are dirty. Sheesh. Three things this morning. First, our problem. As we look at these four verses. Secondly, the battle that's real and the way to victory. First thing is our problem. In verse 7, James starts with the word, therefore. Therefore, submit to God. The word, therefore, hopefully you all know, you're good Bible students or whatever, that you realize whenever you see the word, therefore, or assuredly, you should you got to look back and say, what is the therefore, therefore? Or in other words, because of everything I've just said, this is what you should do. Amen? Because of what everything James has just laid out before this verse, verse 7, this is what we should do. So we need to look back because the problem has been found in verses 1 to 4. James is showing us a problem we all struggle with. In verse James 4, 1 to 4, he says, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. 
You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And that's some hard challenges right there, but James is talking to all of us. And we need to be honest because really we all have a problem, amen? Whatever part of this, this problem that you're facing right now, whether your friendship with the world or you're struggling with coveting or whatever, whatever your problem is right now, the main cause of all of our problems is the same. You with me? We are all a bunch of sinners. We are all a bunch of sinners and we need to quit pretending we're not. Man, it makes me crazy You go to churches where they're like so fake. Everybody comes with their little suit. Everybody walks in there like, my life's perfect. Go out, oh, my life's perfect. What a lie. I would rather go to a church where everybody's up front crying and crying out to God to forgive them and move. Because that's where we really need to be at the altar on our knees begging for Jesus to help us, or help our family members. But James is talking about the problems we all face here. And sin is everywhere. We really need to be honest. I'm not talking about being honest with me or with your spouse or with your family. I'm talking about honesty with yourself, in your own heart, and with God. That's what we need to be honest about. Now, we all should have people that you can, you can talk to. Every person needs somebody that is more mature in their faith that you can go to when you're having struggles, that you can, they can pray for you and talk to you and help you. Amen? But the truth is, we all stand naked before God. One day, you're going to stand before Jesus by yourself. And you're going to hear one of two things. Well done, good and faithful servant. You're going to hear, depart from me. I never knew you. Terrible words. The worst words you'll ever hear, depart from me. I never knew you. And we easily, all of us struggle with sin. We easily can fall into the world. The struggles of the world, materialism is huge. I was actually driving around. I took Zeke's little truck yesterday. I was driving around because I used to live up in Hesperia. I was driving around. I, drove, I went to the Victor Valley Mall. I was like, wow, the mall is still booming. Most malls, I don't know if you've been around America, but most malls across America are complete ghost towns. Anyway, I was walking through the mall, and I'm like, wow, materialism is really raging in this place, isn't it? You with me? Wow. Everything is like, buy me, buy me. You need, you need lust, 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 pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. Now, I'm not saying all the stuff is bad. I like my, wherever my phone is. I like my iPhone, amen? It's a great tool. I do all my messages on it. I like things. I like, it's no nothing wrong with enjoying the things that God has created and given us, but there's a big, a very clear line between worshiping God and worshiping the world. But here James lays out first in verse 1, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from desires for pleasure that war in your members, right? Materialism. Your flesh loves to feel good. The desire for pleasure, it's everywhere. Like I said, at the mall, the television, the internet, everywhere you look. The world's calling you to come. Come and enjoy the pleasures of life. Come and drink. Eat, drink, and be merry. Marijuana is like out of control in this country. It's terrible. Calling you to come. Enjoy the pleasures of life. Reject Jesus. But I want to remind you something very important. Jesus is calling you too. I never forget the first one. I was unsaved reprobate, living at my, going to my church, that God spoke to me so clearly through this verse. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Jesus spoke. He's hopefully speaking to you right now. He's saying, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. See, materialism will never satisfy you, nor will sin. Only thing is Jesus that gives you rest. And the big question this morning, which voice are we going to listen to? James continues to challenge us, verse 2 and 3. He says, you lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. And you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. James is talking about strong desire here. It's in all of us. It's called covet, coveting. And coveting is a very difficult, terrible sin because what? It's in our hearts. You can hide the things you covet. You can hide what's in your heart very easily. You need to be very careful because... What's in your heart ultimately will become what you do, right? What's in your heart will be what you do. Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as he thinks in his heart, so he is. 
And this heart issue is very difficult because we all can hide our, what's the sin in our hearts. He goes on in verse 4, he says, James says, calling us adulterers and adulteresses, a tough name, calling us names, but it's true, can be true. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. He's calling us adulterers or adulteresses. Why? Why is he using such harsh language? Because he knows that people are cheating on God with the world. We make it very clear in the Bible. You can't have both. God or the world. You can't, must make a decision. And if you're on the fence, you're, you're, on, you're already in the world. There's no middle ground in Jesus' business. Amen? I tried to work with one foot in the world and one foot in, G, in the church. And I was miserable. I had to make a decision. Who was I going to serve? The world, the flesh, and the devil or Jesus? Greatest day of my life. April 20th, 2004, I finally gave my life to Jesus. Now, have I had struggles from those days? Yes, we all struggle. And every day, that's why it's a daily surrender, a daily walk with Jesus. Daily. And Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he'll hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon or God in the world system. Pretty straightforward challenges. We might not like it, but it's true. And we just need to be honest. We just need to be honest and ask God to help us. And he will. You know, but one of the things you really need to do is, is really look honestly, take a look at your own heart. Be honest with God. Be honest with yourself, what you're struggling with. Because until you're truly honest and really, truly admit your struggles, you'll never, you'll never overcome them. Let me use my own life as an example. I drank alcohol for... I actually went, joined the United States Marine Corps to get away from marijuana and alcohol. And I go in the Marines and the, I, as a military police thinking I'd be in some kind of a rep, uh, whatever, some kind of a better environment. The company Gunny, the guy in charge of me, was a drunk, drunk. And every night he was making fun of us and we didn't go drink with him. And I, spear pressure destroyed me and I started drinking every day. And I, I lied, I was lying to myself and to everyone, oh, I can handle drinking, I'm in control, I can stop whenever I want. What a liar. Until I acknowledged that I had a drinking problem and I couldn't stop and I needed God's help, I could not have victory. As long as I pretended like I was in control and that everything was good, I had no hope. But when I acknowledged, when I got serious but with my own problem and with God, I acknowledged that I had a drinking problem and I couldn't fix it myself. And I came to Jesus and begged him, gave it to him. I don't drink one drop today because Jesus set me free. Amen. It's the same for whatever you're going through. When you acknowledge the problem you're struggling with, whether it be sin or anger or some type of frustration or some type of fear, whatever it is, you just acknowledge it and give it to Jesus. He can take it and change it and turn it into something good. Amen. It transforms our lives leads to our second thing second thing this morning the battle is real verse 7 and 8 he tells us about this battle therefore submit to god resist the devil and he will flee from you draw near to god and he will draw near to you james clearly gives us lays out these two sides of the battle god and the devil you know when some people say oh, i don't believe in god i don't believe in the devil i don't believe in hell i don't believe in eternal life you know what i say it don't matter what you believe it matters what's true does not matter what people believe. If somebody says, I don't believe in God, does that change God? No. What matters is what is true. And the Bible is true. And God is true. And Jesus Christ is the truth. And the, the Spirit is the Spirit of truth. And we need to acknowledge the truth. And James clearly tells us the truth as he lays out the spiritual battle between God and the devil. I wanted to look at the two sides of this battle for a minute. Looking at who is God first. God is the creator. You can go on forever about God. He's a sustainer, life giver. He's a loving, forgiving God who holds all things together. He's the God of gods, Lord of lords, King of kings. Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning God. In the beginning God. Four powerful words. He created the heavens and the earth. If you can believe that verse, my pastor used to say, you can believe the entire Bible. And it's true. Paul talking about Jesus who is God. In Colossians 1, 16, 
and 17, and maybe 18, no, 16 and 17. He says, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. God, the amazing God that we get to know, that we get to serve. Isaiah described God in Isaiah 40, 28. Have you not, he says, have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, never, never faints, nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. In 1 John, God is holy. He is, God is light and there is no darkness at all. 1 John, again, God is love. And I could go on describing God, for, oh, oh, I mean the Bible's, what's the Bible? God's word and tells us who God is. The amazing God. I mean, I look at the stars at night. Well, we have a little courtyard in our, in our building we God built in Uganda our, called the IMOC, and Shunga Mission Outreach Center. You should come visit, see the amazing thing God's doing in Uganda. God put, allows you, please, I pray God would bring a team from here. But in the middle, of, we have a little courtyard. It's open-air courtyard in the middle of our, 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 our mission center. And at night, we turn off all the lights on a clear night. The, you can see, the stars are like right there. And I like think, wow. The God who created those stars that spoke and those things were formed mi millions and billions and billions of light years away. He wants to know me, loves you, and wants to have a relationship with us. It's amazing. God is amazing. I could go on describing God for a long, long time, but who's the devil? The devil's a liar. I will give him one drop of credit. John 8, 44 calls him the father of lies. Colossians tells us that he's already defeated Colossians 2.15 says, talking about Jesus, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Jesus defeated the enemy on the cross in his death and resurrection forever for you and me. Amen. That we can have victory over this spiritual battle. You know, the devil is defeated, but he's still fighting. And he has a plan for our lives, right? The devil has a... Terrible plan, but it's still his plan to what? John 10, 10 tells us the devil's plan to steal, kill, and destroy. What's God's plan through Jesus Christ? You may have life and life more abundantly. The abundant life today that's available through a close, personal relationship with Jesus who's alive. You know, I have a, saw a really clear example of um, spiritual battle that we're, is going on. It may be a little different, but we, do you have the tree video queued up? This video, we st I, I'd been in Uganda three years in this area before I realized that this tree even existed. I'd been driving down, up and down this road, this giant tree, and nobody told me. They're very, and where I'm at in western Uganda, um, witchcraft is very secretive. They don't, they don't talk about it. They're involved in it, but they don't tell anybody. It's like secret. Where I first went, when I first went to Uganda and ran the Compassionate International Orphanage, is in cent was in central Uganda where they're just it's wide open they don't they don't try to hide it. But anyway, this tree God sh showed showed us this tree to us and people have been offering sacrifices tree through this tree for hundreds of years. And when I found about it, I'm like that tree's got to go. This place belongs to Jesus. So anyway, let's play the video real quick. We're here, we're here at the tree in Ashunga, Uganda. This is where the people. For hundreds of years have offered sacrifices to this tree, to the gods or who, to whoever they were offering sacrifices to. And now we are here trying to bring an end to the, to the lies of um, idol worship and bring the truth of Jesus Christ. There's only one God, Jesus, and Yesu Ahulili, Jesus is alive.
You can stop it. You know, that tree really opened my eyes to things about the reality of the spiritual battle around us. I couldn't believe that I'd been going up and down that road and this tree had been looming over that valley for all those years as a, like a beacon of death. The people had been worshiping the devil. Terrible. And I found out about it and I'm like, no way. That tree's got to go. Because we'd seen a huge move of God in that valley and we're like, this place belongs to Jesus. And, uh, I mean, it was crazy because those people, they were so afraid. They believed if you took any of the branches of the tree that you'd be cursed. If you cut the tree, it would bleed. It was protected by the giant snakes. All these lies. And when I, I first went there, I first heard about the tree and found the tree, I actually went there and took one of the branches and carried it yelling, uh, Nyartulu, that's what the tree, they called the th- tree Nyartulu, whatever that means. And I, Nyafa, I was yelling, Nyartulu, Nyafa, as I'm driving my car, driving through the village, screaming out. And all these kids are chasing me. We went up there and we chopped up the tree branch and then we lit it on fire and we cooked bananas over this tree. And then one of the guys that works for me comes up to me and whispers in my ear, Bill, you better be careful. The snake's going to get you. They were dead serious that this tree was going to be, that was, had all this power. Man, and uh, you know, some of the many families that were seriously, there, a lot of people were really involved in offering sacrifices at this tree. One of the families, his name was Richard. His family had been seriously involved in it. Richard was on his deathbed, ready to die. They were preparing to do his burial. He'd been sick for a long time. Nobody knew what was wrong with him, and they were, thought he was dying any day. We cut down the tree the next day. Guess what happened? Richard was better. He immediately was better. Hallelujah. The power of God. I went and shared the gospel. Richard, he gave his life to Jesus. Amen. Um, another family, another one of the families involved in it, there had many children, big boys now, that have been watching their family offer sacrifices to this tree. And they came and told me, Bill, thank you. You showed us that that tree is a lie and that Jesus is true. I tell you, man, God is awesome. The spiritual battle is real. It leads us to the third thing. You know, we were, they were afraid, but we were standing on the promises of God. The Bible says in 1 John 4, 4, it's God's four by four, somebody told me. He said, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Amen. They told me, uh, these, the village leaders said, well, Bill's small gods must be stronger than our small gods. I'm like, I don't have no small god. There's one god, his name is Jesus, and Jesus is greater than anything. It says in the Bible in Matthew that all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. All authority belongs to Jesus Christ. It'll never make you surrender to him. Never. Never. You know, if you don't know my story, I'm almost done. I'm going to make it, Zeke, I promise you. I was an undercover police detective working narcotics and uh, living a secret life. And God, I discovered that God has all authority over all things. I was in a, in a I went through an interview, went to a follow-up investigation at this house, came face-to-face with a drug, an, actually he was an enforcer for the cartel, the Arano Felix cartel, those are old school names, now they're all dead. They'd be getting ripped off, so these, they would deliver drugs, and they started using their enforcers to do the deliveries because they were getting ripped off, and they wanted to kill the people who were stealing from them. So this enforcer shows up with a gun with two pounds of meth, and I come face to face with him, and I was not ready, but he, I pulled out my badge, and he pulled out a gun. I had a gun, but I couldn't get it out. He aggressively moved towards me, pointed the gun right at my head, and I'll never forget it. He was trying to kill me, and might shoot me in the face, and the gun didn't fire. God so clearly showed me that my life was in his hands, that he loved me, that he died for me, but he wouldn't make me follow him. I had to choose life. I had to choose to surrender to Jesus Christ. Best day of my life. And I, gave, I finally listened. Anyway, the last thing we're going to talk about is the victory. Thirdly, the victory is available. It's available today for all of us. And I never really realized that what James is trying to show us here in James verses, James 4, 7 to, 8, 7 to 10, is that he's telling us six things that we can do every, each day to have victory. And I tell you, it's a daily walk with Jesus. Yesterday's manna is not good for today. Man, it's moldy. You need to get up today, every day, and surrender to Christ again each day. 
If you're living off yesterday, you know, a prayer that you said five years ago or something, dude, you need to realize that it's a daily walk with Jesus. And I could go on and on, but my time is too short. But let's leave it at this. Paul says, I die what? Daily. Because it's a daily surrender to Christ. And a daily to do these things. What, G, what James is telling us, firstly, he says, submit to God. That's the first thing he tells us to do. It means complete surrender every day to God. This is a military word. It's like a private uh, submitting to a commanding officer. You give 100% to God every single day. I encourage you before you ever get out of bed to say, Lord, I give you my life today. Help me to follow you today. And then the second thing he tells us to do is resist the devil. Give 100% to God and say, I give you nothing, Satan. I'm not going to give the, the world, the flesh, or the devil anything. Of course, we're going to fall. We're going to make mistakes. We're all sinners. We all are weak. You know, as the Bible verse says, my flesh is willing. I mean, spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak. Amen? Isn't that the truth? Amen? It's true. My spirit is willing, but man, my flesh is weak. And we say we submit to God 100% and then resist the devil. It says that he will run away or he will flee. Give all to God, give nothing to the Satan. And understand Jesus has already won the battle for you. You are all, It says in Romans 8, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen. We are already victor. We already have victory. You read the end of the Bible. Jesus wins. I always use the example with the kids in because they love football or soccer. Amen. And they, there's two teams that everybody in the valley where we have our mission center like. Manchester United or Arsenal. And if you don't like, know about English soccer, these are like two of the main popular teams. And I always use this example for them when I'm talking about Jesus wins. Because when, they, when, when those two teams play, we, have, we play all the matches, matches in our chapel as an outreach to the community. When Arsenal plays Man U, our chapel is completely crammed with like, I, I don't know, hundreds of people, of people at least. They, they stand up in standing room only so they can be in there. Because we have a big screen projector and it's really a great place for them to come. Rather than going into the village and drinking alcohol while they watch the match, they come and, uh, at our place. But I just tell the kids, I'm like, when you come into that match, before the match, when Manchester United is playing Arsenal, you might like Arsenal or you might like Man U, but you don't know who's going to win until the end, right? But we... Jesus already told us who wins, amen? We know right now that the, before we even go into the battle each day, we already know who wins. Since Jesus wins, as his followers, we win. And we might lose the, the individual battles, but we can win the war through Jesus Christ. It says, resist the devil and he will run away. He must flee. And the third thing, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. What an amazing truth. That God wants us to step towards him. And he promises that if you draw near to me, he promises to draw near to you. And the truth is God is with you, you know, through the Holy Spirit. When we got saved, if you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he gave you a gift, the Holy Spirit that lives in you. And the Spirit that lives you in you is greater than the Spirit in the world. And you can walk with the Holy Spirit wherever you go. He's with you. You talk to him and cry out to him all the time. The Holy Spirit is with you always. He'll never leave you nor forsake you, so don't leave him. He'll never leave you. Don't leave him. These are the fourth thing. It says, Paul says, I mean, John, uh, James says, cleanse and purify. He says, cleanse in your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. The fourth thing we need to do is acknowledge our sins and cry out to God, cleanse us and purify us. Our hand, cleansing our hands is representing the sins, the outward sins that we do outwardly. Purify your hearts as the inward sins in our heart. We're crying out to God moment by moment to cleanse the outside. Cleanse, purify our inside. Praying and admitting our sins, repenting from our sins, turning from our sins, and again surrendering. Sometimes moment by moment in the difficult times and completely all of it by faith. Allowing the blood of Jesus to cleanse you and completely Wash you clean inside and out. Leads us to our fifth thing. He says, lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your, glorm and your joy to gloom. He's talking about, again, being, have, realizing the seriousness of our sins. And letting our sins draw us to our knees and even tears. Rec recognizing that sin is a serious problem. 
And we need to cry out to God and be honest with our God and with ourselves about our sin problem that God would help us. Something will happen when you come to God in complete brokenness. He meets you. Recognize you're crying out to God to help you, forgive you for your sin, weeping over your sin. And the last thing he says, humble yourself. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. It means take your place at the foot of the cross, the feet of Jesus, in the dirt because of your sins. He says this is in the sight of the Lord. Acknowledging when we see a sight of God and his holiness and we see ourselves, we're going to see the darkness of our sin. And we're going to be humbled. It says in the sight of the Lord, right? Even David said in Psalm 51, against you and you alone I have sinned. David was clearly understood that his sins were against God. David was honest with God, honest with himself, and he came to God in complete humility and brokenness, and God lifted him up. Exactly what James tells us will be the victory for us. We will humble ourselves before God in the sight of the Lord. He will what? He will lift you up. Victory is available now, and victory is found in humbly walking before our God. Galatians 5, 16, Paul says, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And this message in James is only one place that the Bible talks about the victory that's ours through, uh, over the spiritual battle that we all face. Ephesians 6, I encourage you to read that chapter. It talks about standing and the spiritual armor. Here in Galatians 5, Paul's telling us the way to victory is to walk with Jesus, walk in the spirit, to daily, minute by minute, Surrender and walk, allowing God to have victory and control of your life. Daily dying yourself and allowing Jesus to have control, moment by moment, walking in the Spirit, walking in victory. You know, I just want to close with this thought, probably like one minute. Walking in the Spirit means walking in victory. Again, I said this already. When you trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, God gave you a guarantee. He gave you his self. He gave you the Holy Spirit that lives in you. And I was thinking about this. Can anyone defeat God? Is there anyone who can defeat God? No. And that means if God is living in you and you truly will walk with him and surrender to him and, and, daily, and just be honest and, and humbly cry out to him that nobody can defeat you. Powered by the Spirit. Can anybody defeat God? No. Can anybody, the spirit living in us and we're walking in the spirit, can anybody defeat us? No. Those daily walking with God cannot be defeated. E this is the thing I was thinking about. Even if God allows this body to die, who cares? I mean, let's be honest. If you really understand the Bible, when this body dies, I'm going to see Jesus. Don't you want to see Jesus? I do. I can't wait. I don't know what he looks like, but I want to see him. And I'm going to see him. It's like I, I believe the joy of heaven, the blessings of heaven, uh, most of them are going to because we're going to see Jesus. We're going to be with God forever. And I have no exact idea what that means, but I know it's going to be amazing. And I'm going to be there. And I pray you'll be there too. Amen. For Christians, this world is not our home. This is not your home. Don't let the flesh and the world and the devil and all the materialism around you suck you in and destroy you. This world is passing away and all that is in it, John says in 1 John 2.15, he says, those who follow the world are going to pass away, but those who abide in Jesus will abide forever. Amen. I'm going to close with this verse and if I worship you, if you want to come forward, I don't know how you guys close, but the world is not our home. Philippians 3.20 says, for our citizenship is in heaven, for which we also eagerly await for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. One day the battle will be over. Until that day, we have a spirit living in us to empower us to have victory, to walk in victory today. Amen? Let's pray. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your goodness and your grace and your love. And I pray for everyone in this room. God, you know each of them. You know each person here. You know each person's sins. You know each person's thoughts. You know their struggles. And you still love them. And you love me. I'm a terrible sinner, God, but you love me. God, I pray that every person here, all of us, will stop playing games with the world. Stop pretending materialism is okay. 
stop buying into the lies of the world and the flesh and the devil, and that we'd truly follow the truth of you, Jesus. Your word, in your name we pray.